Hello everyone. I'll start sharing my screen. Yeah. A second. Do you see it? Yes. Awesome. Okay. Let's start. So, brief introduction. I'm Ihar Dovye. I'm a Salona Set Solutions Architect in SoftSurf. I have been working in SoftSurf for slightly more than four years already. Uh, Ro, I have once again slightly more than 13 years of experience in web development, front and back. And I have a couple of other accolades that I listed here. Today I'm going to talk a bit about micro frontends. And I like to kickstart this talk with a quote, a tweet actually. Um, for a person who I think majority of you are pretty familiar with, or at least have you know heard the name. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll feel more confident, more knowledgeable about micro contents than um, Dan Abramov, co author of Redux, was in 2019. Let's start with a definition. Microfrontends is an architectural style where independently variable frontend applications are composed into a greater whole. Quoted here is the article published on martinfowler.com site just a few weeks after Dan made his, his tweet. Um, actually, it's not the first time this term was mentioned at this site and in general across the internet. In fact, it appeared first on uh, ThoughtWorks Technology Radar first three years before that in 2016. The uh, recommendation was to assess and uh, the reasoning was that, I quoted here, teams have often struggled to avoid the creation of front-end monolith that are as difficult to maintain and evolve as the monolithic server-side applications we have abandoned. Now, uh, when this recommendation talks about monolithic server-side applications that are abandoned, you might uh, guess that it, it talks uh, about microservices. In other words, we can uh, also often see this definition illustrated graphically. So that's what we have before, right? We have a monolithic front end client application that hopefully consists of several functional models, um, you know, divided by features, by domains. And in the end, we have something like this. That really looks similar to what we have with microservices. And um, this, um, the whole idea of micro frontends, it's much more often represented this uh, catcher definition than this quote I, I just gave. It, sorry, goes like this, microservices for the front end. Yay. Um, if you pause and you think about this for a moment, you might see that it's a bit unusual, actually, to define one architectural style um, with another, with a reference to another architectural style and just split these by environments. So what it means to us is that to understand what micro frontends are, we need to understand or at least to recap what microservices are. So once again, let's start with a definition. Uh, this is another definition from Martin Power's site. And this time it's written by the man himself. So microservice, or microservices architectural style is an approach when we develop a single application as a suite of small services. Each of those small services is running in its own process. And 
microservices communicate between each other and with their clients with some lightweight mechanism. Often, this is uh, an HTTP resource API. This definition was given in 2014. The article itself considered to be somewhat of an iconic item. And this article heralded, and I'd even use the word ignited, microservice movement across the world. So microservices to really become widespread, ubiquitous. Um, and this pattern is quite common to see these days. So I'm pretty sure most of you, majority of you are pretty familiar with this. So once again, sorry. It looks like this. We have monolithic application, server application that is run. On a single server machine. And that hopefully although these days, most of the time, we are not, can you hear me? Okay. So most of the time we are not talking about um, monolith as a globe of mud. It has some structure, right? But uh, this is still a monolith. And we end up with something like this. Now I'm not going to talk about all the benefits that we get from going from monolith to microservices. What I would like to emphasize instead is the thing, the feature of this style that actually unlocks these benefits. And this is a switch from a shared execution context that we have as Monolith to a distributed execu execution context that we have with microservices. Distributed means actually the, these execution contexts are isolated. So what happens when we are running microservice A doesn't affect, at least it shouldn't affect if this pattern is followed properly, what happens with microservice B and vice versa, of course. Um, this feature is what actually unlocks, what triggers the benefits that we, we know. Right. If you are able to run each microservice in isolation, we can scale each microservice in isolation in a much easier way than we can try to do that to attempt uh, when we have a monolith. If we are running each microservice in isolation, we can test them in isolation. We can deploy them in isolation and we can well develop them in isolation. It's much easier to do uh, in comparison with monolithic application. It's still possible to you know, dedicate each team to some kind of slice if you have it in a single repository, but it's more complicated with monolith than it, it's with microservices. So as a result, we uh, have much improved team autonomy. Teams are independent. What it usually means, and I'm, I want to be clear about this, I'm not considering this to be best practice, but it's possible to use completely separate technology stacks for each of your microservices. So in this example, microservice A is running with Node.js, microservice B uses Python, microservice C is running on Go and microservice D is running on Rust. That's fine as long as once again, those microservices are isolated. Um, it's not, I mean, we can, we can talk about whether or not it's a good thing to have, but once again, that's possible. But um, why no one invented microservices before, right? Why we only started talking about microservices and implementing actually microservices in the middle of uh, 2010s, right? Teenage years. It didn't happen because engineers of the past were stupid. 
or something. It was before it wasn't really feasible to do it this way because of hardware constraints and operating system constraints as well. If you study the past, you'll see that microservices race kind of coincided with rise of containers. And before that, we had the whole idea of virtualization spread slowly, actually across the whole landscape of hardware and I'd say a level of software that's really close to the hardware, like operating systems and drivers and stuff like that. So it wasn't because no one thought about microservices before. It was because it wasn't really feasible to do that before. Um, another, uh, by the way, uh, another um, approach type of uh, design that also uh, we, which prepared to coincide with this um, rise of microservices were clouds. Because ideally we want to distribute our execution context as wide as possible. And clouds are perfect example, perfect um, engine to do that. Uh, there is more, actually, of incidents. Uh, usually when we see microservices running, uh, we, we can still use them in a fashion when each microservice is used by exactly a single client. But most of the time, we have some kind of combination. We have some kind of cooperation. So microservices are running in... Um, orchestrated distributed way and often in parallel. Operations are done on microservices in parallel. That um, to me explains a quick rise of Node.js among the ranks of server-side technologies because running uh, your code, single big piece of code in Node.js usually creates a problem because JavaScript is still finger threaded. Yes, there are ways to handle this, to tackle this problem in uh, Node.js, but those are usually workarounds. Node.js per se, it's still finger threaded. Now, if you have orchestration out of the question and uh, each of microservices can concentrate on doing just a single task, and hopefully this task is not computational heavy, microservices solve, solve this problem. Another benefit uh, of this approach, yet another benefit of this approach, um, is that orchestration per se becomes a separated concern. Now, um, that's not actually just a benefit, only a benefit, it's also a downside because it's harder to orchestrate microservices. And once again, anyone who designed microservices know that for, for sure. So with microservices, we need to provide at least, um, well, not at least two crucial pieces of this solution. One is uh, orchestration itself. You, you just need to control your microservices. Um, you need to provide some kind of control plane that we'll um, be looking for and scaling those microservices appropriately how they used, and if one microservice goes down, they will be able to restore it. Uh, another thing is, as this orchestration is more physical, it's more about Zookeeper um, responsibility, we also had to provide some kind of logical organization so that microservices are seen as a single application, a single um, application solution context. That something should handle the cross-cutting concerns, ideally, right? Authentication, login, other types of observation. That's something that should be done with a separate component. Sometimes it's API gateway that is responsible for all the things. Sometimes other approaches uh, might be applied here, but still, there's something that should be done. Now, with all that in mind, Let's get back to micro frontends. 
In fact, let's start with its flavor that is advertised often. In fact, I'd say that it's advertised much more often than it should. And that's what I call here multi-views. You can also um, see a term horizontal split introduced by Luca Metzalira, materials that he prepares. And the idea is that we are able to run our front-end applications in exactly the same fashion that we run um, microservices. Multiple per single page working at the same time in parallel. Um, the obvious benefit is that each client application is kind of separate. So we have maximum team autonomy and I'm sorry, I just couldn't resist placing this picture here because yeah, that's what we might have. We might have each team able to choose frameworks of their flare, what, what suits them. We might have one application running with Angular, another application running with UGS, another application running with React, another with Svelte, you name it. What is the problem with this approach? In a web browser, execution contexts are never truly really isolated. And uh, let me emphasize this. It's not just about sharing, not sharing resources. Um, there were other way around sharing actually resources of a single computer. It's worse because if you are talking about sharing an environment, environment that will be sharing resources, that is a web browser. It's not, in fact, it's not just even a single web browser. It's a single tab, a single screen, a single web page that has to provide the resources to those microservice applications. Now, we still have JavaScript that is single thread. We still have uh, CSS. Yes, there, was some, there is some progress here, but our CSS is still global, right? So whenever we are talking about distribution and isolation, uh, we are going against the flow because in Aten, they are capable of doing many, many wonderful things. But virtualization was never really a concern from browsers, just not their domain. The closest we got there yeah, is with frame sets. And if at an offline event, I, I would, other have the audience doing, you know, some, some kind of gymnastics and they're asking some questions. Have you worked with frame sets? Have you enjoyed the work in these frame sets? And uh, the truth is industry uh, didn't really go this way. Frame sets are considered deprecated. They are still supported by browsers, but they are considered deprecated. Yes, there are iframes still, but even iframes are considered to be, you know, some, something sitting on the edge because once again, they are not distributing their resources. They're still using the resources of a single browser tab. Mm. Unfortunately, I'd say that for some teams, for some companies, the idea of having each team able, capable of working on the product in complete isolation was too, too big of a benefit. That's one thing. Another thing is that maybe those, um, teams considered this, the whole idea of being able to run uh, multiple frameworks at the same time 
to be a really great technological challenge. And sometimes you get, they get too excited when uh, seeing challenges like this. Sometimes you wear what I would call a mathematician or explorer hat. And sometimes that means that we revel in trying to solve the challenges, solve the problems. And that's, that's something that, uh, you know, starts from the school years and institutes because that's what, what we do when, when, when we learn, right? Engineers, on the other hand, or at least most of the engineers that I know, they hate problems like that. They hate unknown. They hate something that uh, they couldn't estimate with um, more or less a nice level of confidence, especially engineers that work with enterprise web applications. Um, still, in this conflict of mathematicians and engineers, um, seven years ago, about seven years ago, 2014, 2015, uh, too many teams decided that, well, it's still a really interesting change. And of all of these stories, I would really like to describe and the story of Spotify. Now, Spotify uh, is not singled out here because, um, you know, I, I have an utter respect for Spotify engineering team because the scale of problems that they have to solve, that's something that not not all of, the, all of us have, have, have to do, have to handle. Spotify is big, Spotify is large. Spotify has unique technological challenges. Um, Spotify is mentioned here for two reasons. One is actually that they are big and they are able to dedicate budgets and to basically spend some efforts on truly Exploring this, they won't be stopped because, well, they, they tried and they failed, so that's not all. no. <clears throat> the second argument is that Spotify is actually mentioned still as an early adapter of multiple microphone pants approach. By still, I mean you can still find articles written in. 2021, 21st, and even this year, that still mentions Spotify and Spotify approach as a true valid one for microphone. So what, what Spotify uh, did, they identified the constraints of the browser and they decided to go with iframes. To organize communication between iframes, they decided to use what's called window.postmessage .post interface, right? With this, uh, you can organize some kind of orchestration between your iframes. Of course, uh, they had to build um, all the logic. And basically, uh, what they did is, uh, I think, can be described as building Kubernetes for the front end. Now, if the method of some team building Kubernetes for the front end um, doesn't fascinate you and scare you, terrify you, at the same time, well, maybe, maybe we need to talk. Anyway, um, what happened? is that uh, while well, Spotify started doing these experiments in 2015, they stopped doing it at some point in 2017. So they, um, I think, kind of quickly realized that it's just not the best approach for them. Uh, Look at me, mentions uh, Spotify quickly. Briefly, he mentions uh, their case, but tells that, well, they tried it and they didn't really go there because of performance reasons, performance problems. Um, but there is a better story told by tweets of 
microphone, uh, not microphone, Spotify engineer. So in the end, Spotify realized that using a single framework, they actually chosen, uh, have chosen one repository to store the components. Is much, much better way than using this whole microphone tents for single page approach. Like I said, Spotify is um, not the only case. In fact, I guess so many teams tried to explore this that two years ago in 20, 2020, ThoughtWorks had to issue kind of specific blip on that technology radar. They label it as microphone and anarchy. It's, you know, I mean, this quote that I, I have here, it summarized perfectly the pattern or rather anti-pattern, right? That is still too often seen in uh, microphone dance practice, in UI practice, because 2020 is just two years. Um, two years ago, right? Does it mean that we should always avoid this? Unfortunately, uh, sometimes there's just no way around um, this solution. Sometimes we just have to use iframes. For example, um, when we integrate some really generic component that won't be developed by us, that's provided to us by some external system, then yes, we use iframes. We use iframes for video, for document editors. We might use them for uh, discussions and so on and so forth. So in this case, we are talking about truly external system that we have little control, but we just have to integrate it. Then we'll need to provide isolation microphone dance, it's, uh, sorry, iframe systems. All right, they also use the same approach sometimes when we just have to integrate some legacy application in our solution. So there are exceptions as which any rule, but the rule is that whenever you start a greenfield project, you should definitely avoid this. We should definitely avoid trying to go into this in a too naive way. Okay, you, you might say maybe that's the problem, right? Maybe an attempt to use multiple frameworks. That's that. What what hold, what still holds microphone back? Well, um, not exactly. If we take a look and how microfinance can be implemented with, I mean, the same approach using multiple microfinance and the same page um, without using different frameworks, we still have two potential pitfalls that we should be extremely careful about. If you're going to make our micro contents well, similar to our application, containing all the business logic, all the you know shared infrastructure, then we might end up with something like this. And if you take closer look here, you might see that all these reacts here for each micro frontend, those are slightly different. Maybe the versions are different, right? Maybe each team uses slightly different version of the React, like 17 and 18, 17 and 16. And you must, you may know that with React, it's well not completely about just the major version number. 
Well, it's not actually just about X or any other big framework. It might be about validation component or form component or some library even. In the end, you'll have version and problems that are quite similar to another blast from the past, so-called DLL hell. This time you have it on web and you might actually end up with bigger problems, especially in debugging, uh, than you would have with just multiple frameworks because there at least you can somewhat isolate them. Here you, you might have bugs because of racing conditions, you know, all kinds of problems caused by different versions of your dependencies running in, the, in your browser at the same time. And you should be careful about this. You might say that, okay, let's team our microfinance that's making even more simple, even more dump in a good way. And let's focus on the idea that each microfrontend should correspond essentially to each microservice, right? So we have a microservice, let's have a corresponding micro front end for that, and let's just reuse this micro front end. So once again, multiple front ends at the same page. There is another problem here. It's not unsolvable, but it's something that you should care of, should take care of. So this is the view, potentially you have multiple instances of your smart component or something that can be defined as nano front end, I don't know. The problem I think can be illustrated with, uh, let's take tag, right? Tag is an example. You have your entities, um, different items that you need to show and you are able to apply tags to them. And ideally you want to store just IDs of these tags, right? But you have something, some kind of common component that knows how to fetch data for each tag and how to draw itself. If you do it directly, if you just place multitude of these tag components on the page, you'll have what's uh, called in a um, really brilliant lection given by once again, Luca Metzalira, that's called um, microphone dance aunt patterns. It's called API hammering. You see each tag has to do a request to your backend. And if you have too many tags, you have to manifest. Essentially, it's n plus one problem once again. Nothing new. You might try to find some kind of workaround and to do some kind of orchestration for that. For example, each entity should do what's called multiplexed API request. But you might end up in even worse situation because at least if you cache your, uh, if you work with stacks, um, requests themselves can be cached, right? You can have three or fours. Uh, with orchestration done this way, uh, the number of requests will be smaller, but most of the time you'll, you'll end up with cache misses. So, um, sorry. Okay, does it mean that all hope is lost for microfinance? Does it mean that this is should, should actually be considered an architecture anti-style, something that should be avoided most of the time at least? Well, not exactly, but um, before we start talking about cases when we actually can apply microfinance approach, that take a step back and narrow down the scope a bit. Let's talk about enterprise web applications. Why? Because well, enterprise web application is what, what is really considered a specific, I'd say, interest for 
us as a service company, right? <laughs> Once again, let's start with the definition. Now what we know about enterprise web apps and applications in general. Enterprise applications are about organizations. They're targeted not at individuals, but at organizations. And uh, with organizations, um, it's important to understand it's it's not just social network, right? Because social network is also an organization. Enterprise have coordinated cooperation of their parts. And this coordinated cooperation is what usually defines enterprise applications. Now there are well, several types more than I, I listed here. We, we have CRMs, we have human resource management system, knowledge management system, and so on and so forth. And these types, they usually have something in common, both in terms of functional and functional requirements. For example, um, search engine optimization usually is not a concern, right? Because you don't have to optimize your CRM or CMS uh, so that its parts are searchable in you know global browsers. On the other hand, authentication for these systems almost always is a must. And you rarely end up selling like in e-commerce applications, right? Uh, we also uh, need to focus to spend extra time on durability. On the other hand, usability might be of less value because users of enterprise applications usually don't have much choice. They just had to use a specific application because it's, uh, it's part of an enterprise. It's adapted, All right? What are the other things special about enterprise application? Um, once again, quoting Martin Fowler, enterprise applications usually are large, right? Large and complex. And actually large these days, I mean, this quote is from 2003, right? And uh, these days, uh, yeah, enterprise apps were the biggest, the largest ones. Now it's a bit different. Netflix is large, Spotify is large, right? But those are not enterprise apps. What is actually different is um, complexity. Most of the time, enterprise apps have much more complex business processes, user stories their business logic, what they um, what their users have to handle, to, to tackle, right? They're much more complicated than these applications that are targeted to individual users. Now, um, let's consider kind of practical example. And what could be a better example for um, talk about web applications other than to-do application, right? Let's take a to-do application when they have tasks and they have users, right? And each user can uh, create a task, complete a task, maybe um, edit title and, you know, to quite typical things with tasks. And let's try to enterprise, enterprise it. Let's think of what will change in, uh, in this application. If you try to turn this into one that's suitable for enterprise. Now, we'll have users as a separate domain. It might be a separate separate web application. And it goes like that. You can assign your tasks to users, right? So in each task, you can see what are the users it's assigned to. 
At the same time, it might be really beneficial to see what other tasks assigned to users. This is kind of user journey that most likely will be used by managers. What else? As enterprise, you don't usually define your tasks in isolation kind of vacuum. You define those based on some goals. And most likely you'll need to have yet another application or at least some domain covered that will be centered on goals and reports. That is most of the time really useful to leadership. What else? As enterprise, we often have what's called um, event-driven mentality. So goals and tasks are often based on some industry-wide events. So we'll need these components as well. And they will be separate types of users. Well, not necessarily different users, separate you know, people, but it will be different roles that will be working these events. Now, and that's really important, those parts won't be working in isolation. They will communicate. And users will have, in the worst case, um, work with some data in one application, then do my favorite type of business process, spreadsheet-based based data flow, and they have to transfer this data into another application. And that often creates quite a challenge for enterprise app. And that's usually, once again, is unique to enterprise applications. Now, what, what users actually want? Something like this. They want a single unified application that will provide them with the same look and feel, or more or less the same, right? Uh, that will provide them with the same um, auth authentication, of course, and that will give them something that will alleviate this problem and tame the complexity of managing their data in separate isolated system. Now, this is something that we can use when we revisit the definition of the pattern the stock was started this. Micro frontends is an architectural style when independently deliverable frontend applications are composed into a greater whole. This definition in, uh, in this article, it has a follow-up that talks about specifically about applicability of this style. Micro frontends applicable if there is enough complexity in each page that we could easily justify a dedicated team for each of these. And each of those teams should be able to work on the page independently of all the other teams. They should be able to develop, test, deploy, and maintain the code without worrying about conflicts or coordination with other teams. Our customers, however, should still see a single seamless website. So uh, it turns out that there is another way of applying micro front ends as a pattern so that only each of the, um, of, of the independent front ends are visible once at a time. And all of those reuse the same platform. And uh, this is an approach that can be called monoviews. Uh, you can also see, you might also see term vertical split. What is really important about this, um, this sub-style is that as we just, so it's an extremely great fit usually for enterprise web apps because uh, we might start from these apps spread across or we might start with them down like this. You might have tasks, users, 
goals and events and implemented within a single monolithic application. And what our users will actually want is something like this. When they have essentially a single platform, but is an option to go to different parts of this platform. Seamlessly. What's fun about you know, this style is that uh, ThoughtWork article that's uh, quoted here and linked here, listed here, it's actually the only style <laughs> that's mentioned there. They never explicitly mentioned multi views. How it can be implemented? Uh, usually, there is a single container application which renders common page elements such as headers and footers, uh, which might contain some shared components. Mm -hmm. uh, that container app addresses some cross cutting concerns like authentication and navigation. And it's also responsible for bringing the various micro front ends together onto the page. Uh, loading and unloading them. Um, how it can be done? Really direct way into this is what can be called build time integration so that each container um, basically um, merges all the related micro front ends. And each applet is a dependency of a container. Usually each applet is stated as some kind of plug. Um, it's the most simple to implement, but it's the most restrictive one because each time your any of your microphone changes, you'll have to rebuild the whole application. So it's hard to synchronize. It doesn't really provide that much of team autonomy in terms of deliverable. You can still do this. You can still um, test those in isolation, but it's it becomes much harder when you have to deliver these changes at once. Still, it can be done. It can be used, especially with smaller microfrontends. Another way, runtime integration with iframes. So we have this container application that knows about each of the applets, and it can just integrate them you know, by placing the iframe and switching between the iframes as users navigate on the top level. Uh, there are several downsides to that. So the only benefit I'd say is that in this case, teams are independent, teams are autonomous, but still mm, there is no, or at least it's much more complicated than it should be, state share. Navigation is well a bit patchy, and so on and so forth. So this this uh, it, it's possible to use this approach, but it's considered to be kind of an edge case. Another approach it's a inverse build time dependence. Instead of having each applet as dependency of a container, we actually have container as a dependency of each applet. It doesn't really work well with a single page application because you just have to navigate across those separately and you have to reload each applet separately. And that means reloading the whole container. But if your container app is not that big, it's still possible to use this approach. And in fact, I'd even say that um, it's the second simplest in terms of organization. Uh, the downside is that when there is just too many microphone end apps to handle, synchronization of this container application becomes an issue. Uh, you, you need to be absolutely sure that these teams work in more or less with more or less the same speed same pace of updating this container application if it's updated. 
There are also some, <clears throat> some other difficulties because each applet usually in this case maintains its own environment. And if your if functionality of your container application has to reuse this environment, it's um, well, it's a bit less straightforward. Finally, approach that became available relatively recently, I'd say maybe two years ago. It's runtime integration that uses model federation. We still have applets essentially defined as dependency of our container, but these dependencies are loaded in runtime. So what happens if user navigates to, let's say, application A tasks, they will only get models per container itself and all the models that are related to this application, A, right? If they switch to application B, then in the runtime on the fly, um, corresponding models are loaded. So um, your browser only contains what, what's necessary and it's not bloated in a way that it can be with um, the first approach with build time and actually with build time and the rest as well. Uh, this is the approach that seems extremely promising. There are some caveats, for example, you you shouldn't only care about loading those dependencies, but unloading them correctly as well. Otherwise, you might uh, see your browser start crawling when you navigate across too many micro frontends. And you also have to be careful about external dependencies, like Google Maps, something that you don't integrate in your bundles directly, because unloading those. Usually it's not that trivial. Still, like I said, that's something that is really worth exploring. Um, Webpack has it, White has it, bit White. And there is also another initiative that um, tries to make model federation essential generalized generic concept. So it's not that dependent on specific specific um, bonding to. Let's quickly recap what we talked about today. I'll start with uh, an obvious yet often forgotten thought. Frontend is not backend, period. There are things, patterns, styles that are perfectly applicable in the backend, but they, they make little sense on the front end and vice versa. And we should also all, always remember it. In particular, definition of micro front ends as microservices for the front end, it doesn't make much sense because you cannot truly re-implement isolated contexts on, on your front end in your browser. Maybe at some point, maybe, you know, a few years, uh, browsers, uh, vendors will actually start paying attention to that. And maybe we see something like this. It's not available now. And, you know, you can, you can try to fight it, but you should be conscious about it, that you're fighting against the flow. If you're talking about Substyles of uh, micro front ends. Um, from my perspective, you should definitely avoid micro front end sonic. You should definitely avoid an attempt, or at least try to avoid an attempt to reuse the same, uh, to reuse multiple um, frameworks and other dependencies in the same page. In general, multiple micro front ends or micro front ends, uh, multiple micro front ends at the same page or horizontal split. I uh, really suggest applying extra care when you design and when you implement these solutions. If we talked about it, uh, there are versioning problems, there are problems with API hammering. So 
there's something to think about, even if you do some kind of runtime integration. It's not dependent on no matter how you integrate these components. I still will have these issues. On the other hand, I really think that mono microfinance is a great way of structuring your web applications, especially enterprise web application, because it perfectly answers the Conway's law. And um, it's easier, it's more maintainable, it's more digestible, it's more flexible than having a single monolithic application or set of hubs in your enterprise infrastructure. And certainly there are some growing pains and you should be aware of those and you should remember that model federation is not a perfect answer. It's not a mature technology yet, but still it looks quite promising. You can explore other options, of course. You can explore build time integration, inverse build time integration, but micro front ends we've done this model federation in this mono fashion or vertical split fashion, really seems something that might become quite popular in the upcoming years. So, well, that's it from my side. I'm open to questions. Hopefully we'll be able to answer those. And by, by the way, sorry, uh, I'll share this, uh, this list of links. Um, I really recommend, I mean, of those four, uh, starting at least the article that's, um, that was posted on Martin Fowler's site and Luca Metzelier collection on microfrontends antipatterns. There's also a really funny article. You probably don't need a microfrontend, um, which by the way still mentions Spotify as an adapter. So yeah, you, you should, I think if you are really interested in this, you should also check that out. And that's it from my side. I'm stopping sharing my screen. Thank Done. you. Thank you, Igor. Uh, we have a, a raised hand. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Like uh, you actually mentioned that during the presentation that uh, it's not really mature technology, like be aware of this and that. And from the other point of view, you were describing the uh, micro frontends for enterprises. And enterprises are usually not uh, like to experiment with something that is not mature enough. So I have a question like on your daily basis, you are working with front ends on enterprise workloads? Uh, well, yes and no, <clears throat> because I mean, the practical example that I had in mind, actually when thinking about this uh, presentation as a whole is uh, the enterprise client that I've been working for three years. It's a brokerage, right? And they have their customer relations management system uh, essentially built with the third approach. So they have each application as a separate, uh, within a separate repository, as a separate deployable, uh, deployable unit. And they have this build terminal. So each container is essentially, um, container application is dependency of each applet. What we started doing is migrating piece by piece these applets onto model federation based approach. And so far it worked fine. Because uh, once again, if you're talking about uh, you know, maturity is defined by the number of edge cases supported and known. Because most of the time, if you just go, you know, the paved path, you are fine. If you start going elsewhere, you might start finding problems. So I think that in the end, it all, as usual, it depends. Some enterprises are fine with experimenting with this approach. And some enterprises uh, do realize that if at some point they have to switch, it's better to start switching earlier. 
like I said, it depends because some enterprises, you're absolutely right, they might see the whole approach as, as risky, right? And they, they draw the weight and see how the whole model federation will turn out. Okay, and then the following small question, how you engage uh, teams to work with this new technology? Like you mentioned that you are like switching from the existing application to this new uh, pattern. So like how, like, did they just uh, go for you and yeah, we will do this or they are struggling, they are fighting with you? They are struggling and they are fighting. Because in the end, that means that they here yeah, they have to choose their habits, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the thing that we we had when we discussed at some point, uh, and it act, it was actually leadership from the client from the customer side, that it's kind of strange and weird that people don't want to learn something and be paid for it because that's what they they will do right they will learn new things and they will be paid you know salaries for that but uh yeah uh, i think that you should have at least leadership support because i mean going with this it provides both functional and non-functional wins for users right and i mean it, it should have a priority it's not always the case, to be honest, for enterprise, because like I said, usability is not that, not that big of concern. But in the end, if your users, if your, you know, if your agents will spend less time on working with these products, that should raise the efficiency and that should in the end, you know, get, get more income, more revenue. But uh, yeah, that's something that should be um, most of the time should should come from the top, right? So either uh, product uh, leadership or engineering leadership or idea in combination that should come to these teams and tell them that you should do it. There are wins for us, for us all. And with this, uh, even these struggle struggles, they will become answered. But usually it's easier to do some new developments first and then to apply it's always easier to do greenfield right and then to try to solve some migration concerns cool. thanks and the last question it's like about the part of all those things uh, that you mentioned only briefly like uh, there is uh, all this uh, micro front ends is nothing without the infrastructure created for it. Like, do you have uh, like kind of uh, DevOps architecture or you are doing all those part of the work? How you separate this between the actual development team and DevOps? We have a dedicated DevOps team, uh, usually. It's not always the case, but usually uh, we, we are talking about uh, dedicated uh, DevOps um, department here, right? That uh, it doesn't do all the work. And uh, these years, most of the time, they try to unload as much as possible to make, once again, teams truly autonomous with this. But uh, they, they help with that. They do help with that. So in, in general, teams are responsible for uh, CI CD process for their application, including micro front ends. Uh, partially, because there might be some kind of template set up down by uh, this DevOps team. And then this template will be is and will be reused by each team independently for their projects. And of course, if there are variations to be introduced, once again, it depends. Uh, sometimes those variations are a bit small and they can be done by teams independently. But sometimes, um, for example, if a team decides to do something really specific about their container application, then yes, the ops team is involved. In fact, actually, it's really a good thing to have a separate team responsible for this container platform application. It can be a separate team, complete, completely separate team, 
or it can be a team that um, works with the core enterprise domain, for example, with task or with users, right? So they will be not just trying new things, but they will be immediately seeing, they will immediately see the results. So that, that's why it's, it, it might be beneficial. They have some kind of driving force behind uh, orchestration behind the container. I see. Thanks. Yeah, thank so you. Alex, uh, I would like to expand this question regarding uh, deploying of this uh, micro front ends as well as uh, versioning of this micro front ends. Do you have any suggestions for uh, management of such? How we, do you load? Do you load? Do you recommend loading uh, partially uh, this front ends or how do you deal? with different um, versions of micro frontends? Yeah, we usually have a container up that points to version agnostic uh, remote entries, if we are talking about model, model federation terminology. So uh, with uh, this to do up example, we have container that is aware that there are four different applets, but it just know their labels knows nothing about the versions, right? So it loads just tasks, just uses, just goals, just events. Now each applet is responsible for loading its proper version. So whenever there is a request to load, let's say tasks slash index HTML, index HTML deployed for a specific environment, for a specific domain, it is responsible for loading the bundle that corresponds to this version. Um, with this approach, you should be careful about caching, right? So that uh, index HTML is not loaded from cache and uh, the, um, this container application is also not, not loaded from the cache. So, um, I mean, itself, HTML file, the manifest. But uh, the small pieces, the bundles themselves, they can be cached and they can be loaded. Um, now, uh, in terms of um, what are the environment that um, users will, you know, browsers will fetch this, it depends. Because the most straightforward approach is when you use just client side rendering, you can just load these bundles directly from buckets. If you used server-side rendering, then um, it's more complicated. In fact, model federation becomes much more complicated. Fortunately, server-side rendering uh, is because of these um, non-functional requirements that CO is not that big of concern, et cetera. It's not usually that much of concern for enterprise web apps. But if you're talking, for example, about e-commerce, then yes, there is a difference. Okay, thank you. And another question regarding uh, model sharing. So can we mm -hmm. share some models between different micro frontends? Uh, yes, but, oh, yes, but uh, with model federation, uh, you can um, avoid loading the model. So let's say we have, um, we have our container application and we have our applet that has some dependency. And when we reload, uh, when we load a different applet, uh, we can at some point want to, you know, share, not avoid uh, reloading that, that dependency. It's more complicated and ideally all the shared dependencies should be in this container application. And um, because of the bundles are structured, uh, as well. So, um, okay, I'll, I'll answer it like this. It's possible, but in some cases it might be more effort on trying to organize this than actually should be wanted. And remember that if these applets, they do share versions at one point in time, it might not always be the case. At some point, these applications, some of these applications might go faster and uh, they might be helped by 
something that's defined as its shared shared dependency. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Maybe one more questions. I have one question, but I'm not really <laughs> sure how we can apply this on um, this micro front end approach in general. Uh, I mean, if you are using the support as iframes and completely different frameworks, it's not the case when you wanted to share some, um, let's say, states between these applications. But I think if we are moving to use micro front end with model federation approach, uh, I wanted to clarify how we should build the states for our application. Should we follow the strict rule that we have? For example, I'm not talking the particular technology, but for example, Redux, it should be uh, integrated with the, our container application. And internal applets should use this uh, parent Redux storage, or it's OK to separate this between different applets and different teams should it should be able actually to have the isolated Redux storage per applet. Uh, usually, it's considered um, both for actually for multiple view micro fronts and mono micro fronts. The less knowledgeable your shared container is, uh, the more isolated it is, the better, because once again we reduce the number of dependencies. So. I would rather have a separate store for this container app that is handling on the concerns that are specific that are shared, right? For example, user context or something like that, like that. And it is able to communicate through event bus, for example, with each applet separately instead of just doing a single store um with all the state because i mean whenever your applet goes away you have to properly handle this and sometimes it might be i mean it's still possible to kind of reset this right in in the unloading state so uh for example consider this you try to load a new microphone tent and this load has failed for any reason maybe user decide that uh, they are no longer are interested in this specific applet and they just immediately clicked on a new one. Uh, you might end up in a situation then cleaning up this global shared state is of more concern, more effort than it should be. That's why I would, I think uh, at least that it's easier to handle this as separate stores, but the actual call, yeah, might depend on on the situation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Igor, for your uh, performance. Thanks all who ask questions and uh, all who, who joined today for um, to our event. Uh, have a nice day and see you next uh, next event. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.